I love to hang on to certain lines of the text of Scripture and allow them to teach or remind us of their subtle lessons. Like the opening line of this passage. It says, On the following day, in the morning, when they came from Bethany, as he was returning to the city, and then the story goes on from there. But before we jump into that rest of the story, you have to notice the subtle thing that just happened. Jesus has just experienced crowds of people declaring him to be who he actually is, their Messiah and King. They finally got it right. And for the first time in his life, Jesus allowed them to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, which is a Jewish liturgical exclamation of praise to God, imploring God to deliver them. This is what the crowds would shout during the Feast of Tabernacles when the Egyptian Hallel was recited. This shout of joyful hope for deliverance reminded them that they had already been delivered from Egyptian captivity, and they were looking for Jesus to deliver them again from Roman occupation. This was Jesus' chance to drink in the glory that he so rightly deserved. And he did for a few brief minutes. And then instead of hanging around for the feast of honor and a celebration of his triumphal appearance, he promptly left town and headed for Bethany, or bet Ani, the house of the poor, where his friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. See, the point is this. Jesus could have lived in the moment of glory and greatness. He could have drank in the accolade of people who didn't know him deeply but shouted his praises loudly. But instead, he chose to spend the night quietly with friends who really knew him and loved him for exactly who he is instead of for what he could do for him. So the next time you're tempted to think that Jesus hangs out more intimately with the folks who shout his name the loudest in the streets, and I'm not advocating that we don't shout his name loudly in the streets, remember that it was the people who spoke his name quietly in their homes that he was drawn to. So now our story opens with the fact that Jesus was headed back into Jerusalem. It's morning and Jesus is hungry. As he passes by a fig tree, he sees that it has leaves on it. And here's where the story gets a little confusing. So let's get some background in place. For starters, the fig tree is a symbol of or a type for the nation of Israel. In places like Jeremiah 8 or Nahum 3 or Hosea 9, God repeatedly uses the image of a fig tree to refer to his chosen nation. And in every one of those cases, he refers to the fruit of the tree to make his point. So when Jesus approaches the fig tree, well, it's a lot like Jesus approaching Jerusalem. Now it's important to know that it's not fig bearing season. Well, that's not completely or exactly accurate. See, figs have an odd cycle. They start their spring growing season by producing a small crop of something called breba or taksh. I guess I'm saying that right. It's an Aramaic word. It's a small pre-fig fruit that grows on the previous year's shoots. They come in at about the same time as the leaves appear. As the growing year progresses, they're replaced by the actual figs that ripen into the fruit that you and I know. But if you approach a tree covered in leaves in the spring, you should be able to find a crop of these little knobby edible breba. It was considered peasant food. But remember, Jesus is coming from Bethany the house of the poor. The problem's this. If you look at a fig tree in its early season and it doesn't have any of these little breba on it, then it's a guarantee that it won't produce figs when the true growing season arrives. Those trees are cut down with an ax and replaced with fruitful ones. That's what John the Baptist was talking about back in Mark 3 when he said, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. The idea was really pretty simple. If you have a tree that doesn't produce fruit, you remove it to make room for one that does produce fruit. That's how you keep the grove healthy and producing food. So when Jesus finds no fruit or breba on the tree, he's not condemning it to death. He's simply doing in faith and spoken word what would have happened in time. If you think of it this way, it might help. By causing the fruitless tree to die, Jesus is making room for a fruitful one to be planted in its place. This tree's had its season. It's born fruit. It's fulfilled its purpose. Now, by withering it to the roots, the need for its replacement will become even more noticeable to the arborists who care for that growth. 
they'll cut it down and immediately replace it with a tree that bears fruit and brings life to everyone who encounters it. Jesus' interaction with the fig tree is a picture of what's about to happen to Judaism as a whole. He's about to bring the era or the dispensation of law to fulfillment. It's had its season. It cannot bear fruit any longer. So when he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, he's opening up the possibility of a new tree that bears fruit for everyone to eat. Paul makes it painfully clear in Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 7, that the law brings wrath and death because the law is only capable of exposing our shortcomings. But the season of the law has been fulfilled. And now we live in the season or the dispensation of grace, which brings life. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. But in just a few days, he'll look at his disciples and say, this is my body, take and eat, all of you. The tree of death that he would experience has given way to the tree of life. The fruit of the law has been replaced with the bread of life. And in our Father's house, there is bread enough and to spare.